we go. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Ben Kat. Hey, Lisa. Welcome to Scorpio Season. Hey, Ben Kat. I see um, you have a painting in the background there. Is that a painting or a photograph or something you're painting? I do. It's actually around one of the topics I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, oh, awesome. Should we finish out our, uh, maybe we should introduce our stuff and then we can talk about. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. So painting I've got in the background. Um, so today, what letter are we talking about, Venkat? Oh, we are talking about the letter O. Great. Yeah. And, I, you know, at this point, it's pretty traditional for us to have a snack. Do you have, a, do you have an O snack that you're eating? Yes. So for O, I cheated a little bit, and it's not the name of the food, but the shape of the food. So I have an O-shaped candy over here. So this is uh, the Smart Sweets Peach Rings. Oh, nice. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's like a gummy bear kind of thing with, uh, in, in a ring shape. So O, O-rings. What are you Ooh. eating? I've got, um, so I actually, it's called waka, waha, I'm, I'm saying this wrong, waka, waka cheese. It's like white cheese. It's a lot like, um, it's like Mexican mozzarella. Um, so I've got, oh, sticky. I've got a whole bowl full of it with some orange watermelon, actually. Um, that, I, I wanted a red watermelon and then I like, got home and oh, cut it open and it was orange. And I was like, oh, I guess, I guess it's orange. Like, what are you going to do? It's like. Anyways. But it's still ripe, right? I didn't know there was such a thing as orange watermelon. It's not something I knew to look out for. I just picked one out of the like bucket of watermelons at the grocery store, thinking they were all the same, but they were not all the same. So you have orange watermelon and Oaxaca cheese. Mm -hmm. huh. All right, so you win this round. Great. It's much better than my O-ring candy. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, great. So... Uh, let's see, what do we have to talk about today, Venkat? Where do you want to start? All right. Uh, you put down Ofe, right? And that's Feynman's uh, nickname. I did not know that he was called Ofe. Okay, so this has to do with the portrait in the background. This All is right, an let's talk about it. This picture back here is an Ofe. Okay. It's, a, it's a reproduction of it. I found a photo online and got some posters made. So this is a framed poster. From him, but he signed all of his paintings as, as Ofe, um, which was really cool. It was like so his last name. So, for readers who aren't familiar, who we're talking about, there's a very famous physicist by the name of Richard Feynman. I always say Feynman, but it might be Feynman. Feynman, Feynman. I've heard it both ways. Let's go with Feynman. Feynman. He's a very fine man, so I hear. Um, <laughs> he's kind of like known for being a bit of bit of a womanizer later in life um, after his wife died. Um, but yeah, so Richard Feynman, he's also known, best known for, he invented some like diagrams. Quantum, diagrams that yeah. You for when you're talking Quantum about electrodynamics, them. that was his theory. And then he came up with um, diagrams to work with that theory. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so his, the, the book of his that I love is probably one of my favorite books of all time is QED, which stands for mm -hmm. Quantum Electro Quantum Dynamics. Electro -dynamics. Quantum Electrodynamics, yeah. But it's also a funny play on words because QED is also what you mm -hmm. write at the end of a math proof. It's like, it's Latin, right? For like, yep. there it is, thus it is proven. Yeah, I think it stands for Quad Erat Demonstrandum. Do See? you know what that means? Yeah, thus it is proved or something like that. Thus it is proved, yeah. yeah. Which is cute. Anyway, so he's like this guy, but later in life he got into painting. Um, and so this is one of the paintings, for those of you who are listening and can't see it, it's basically a photo of a woman um, just kind of like hanging out. Um, yeah, anyways, but like the one thing that I realized, and I don't, I haven't ever seen anyone else make this connection, but it's like, okay, so it's kind of a mystery about why did he sign his paintings Ofe? Um, because his name's Feynman. Why is his nickname Ofe? And I realized, so like, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I think Feynman is probably, I would put him like, if Jane Jacobs is like the human I've done the most reading about all of their stuff, Feynman would be like, maybe in the close second, like, um, I've read okay. a bunch of his books and, and things. Um, but he spent a lot of time in Brazil in his, during his like, 
I don't know if he spent a whole lot of time, but he definitely in his books, he has a bunch of like books that he wrote kind of short stories about his life and they're all fascinating. Oh, he was part of the Manhattan Project also. So he had to tell stories yep. about um, being in the Manhattan Project. He would like, he was really good at cracking other people's safes. So none of their stuff was like safe from him. He'd go around and like figure out what numbers people had used. It was usually some like math number, like some derivation of like E or something. And he's like, oh, you know, math people just all use the same goddamn numbers, passwords. So he would just like open all the saves and be like, how are you so good at cracking saves? And he's like, well, you guys are predictable. That's how. Um, anyway, so he spent a lot of time in Brazil. Um, he is actually kind of, I don't know, famous for, I don't know how true this is because I didn't spend a lot of time in the sciences when I was in Brazil. But um, he gave all of his lectures in Portuguese, like he learned Portuguese and presented his lectures in Portuguese. So apparently it's quite uncommon for a country to give their scientific lectures, not in English, but in Brazil because of Feynman, partly because of Feynman. Um, it's traditional in like the sciences of Brazil, and the universities to present in Portuguese because um, Feynman made that possible. Anyways, Ofe, I'm pretty sure, I don't have any like, anything to back this up, but I'm pretty sure that his, it's his, the nickname that he got when he was in Brazil. Because in Portuguese, when you say someone's name, a man's name would be O, would be o you say O and then Venkat. So if someone wanted to address you, Venkat, it'd be like, oh, Venkat. Um, oh, okay. Maybe Aliza, like, hey, Lisa. Like, that's just the way you say people's names is you put the, um, it's almost like the, the, oh, okay. the word like O and A are like, it, the English equivalent is the, so it's like the Feynman or the Venkat or the Lisa, we say Ah Lisa. Um, I don't know, it's just whatever. So I, I, I figured it like, so I ordered this print and it showed up and I was like, oh, oh, Faye, that's weird. I'm like, oh, wait, he's, it's because he was like the, um, it's because he's, that's his Brazilian, it's, I don't know, it's cute. It's his Brazilian nickname and he signed all his paintings with it, which is kind of. Wait, horrible. did you verify this or is this just your theory? It's a theory, but I'm like, uh, I'm like, I'm like 99% sure that's, there's like no, there's like no doubt in my mind that that's what's going on here because there's no other, like no other explanation fits as nicely. It would be interesting to try and verify that. It's like, if he spent a lot of time in Brazil, probably somebody there would remember what his nickname actually was or if people called him that, but yeah, that's an interesting theory. So he picked that as his painting nickname. So now I should, uh, if I turn to art later in life, I should call myself Ove or something. Mm. Well, what would you, what nickname would you pick if you had to like pick a nickname for yourself? Like if you had to sign a painting, would you sign it Venkat or VGR or? Yeah, probably just Venkat or VGR. Yeah, I, I'm not big on nicknames and I've never liked nicknames that anybody ever has given me, so. Interesting. Uh, anyway, all right, so Feynman, uh, so while we are on the topic, uh, what else uh, do you have uh, since you've placed him pretty high on your uh, list? Like we are on, next week I saw on the list we are talking about pantheons for the letter P. So mm. this is like Lisa's pantheon. Uh, he's number two on the list after Jane Jacobs. I like I'm hesitating because I like don't really I haven't really put a lot of thought into it and it seems like very like commitment to be like yeah definitely number two but he's yeah he's probably number two. Yeah, he, I think I read parts of QED and but the main source I read about Feynman was not actually one of his own books but uh, this big fat uh, scientific biography by Jagdish Mehra it's called A Beat of a Different Drum. Have you read that? It's no, but Feynman played drums in Brazil. That was what he did. Yeah, so that's where he the title comes from. But this is not yeah. sort of uh, like his own writings. I got the impression just browsing them. Uh, the reason I couldn't actually continue through them, it's like he has a very he has a particular style, and he sort of has a very how do I put it? Uh, there's people who like curate how they present themselves to their to the world. And you can't take them at face value. And Feynman struck me as one of those people. It's like, there's definitely an impression he's trying to create. So I looked around and found that this was probably the academically um, respected critical biography of his. And I read that and it's actually pretty interesting. And one thing that struck me was the book has a fairly detailed discussion of uh, 
Feynman versus uh, two other people who shared the Nobel Prize with him. Um, one was Julian Schwinger, uh, and the other was uh, Tomonaga in Japan. But uh, Tomonaga did something uh, sort of complementary, whereas Julian Schwinger did exactly what Feynman did, but from a different um, route. So he came at it through like very rigorous math derivations, where Feynman arrived at it through his sort of intuitive, you know, right brain diagramming technique. So they took two different paths to the same results. And that always kind of like stuck with me, the description of how that worked out. And um, I remember you know, like uh, there was a quote by somebody about the two of them comparing them. So Julian Schwinger versus uh, Richard Feynman, because they had like, it's an A-B test, right? They both got to the same physics insight and result, but in completely different ways. And this quote, I don't know who it was attributed to, but it said something like, Julian Schwinger is somebody who thinks like you if you are 10 times smarter than you are, whereas uh, Feynman is somebody who you cannot figure out how they think at all. So it's like a difference between uh, really smart people versus geniuses. The uh, What's that line that says, uh, talent hits the target others can't hit and genius hits the target others can't see. So that, there's that kind of difference between uh, at least that, that was a reputational difference between Schwinger and uh, uh, Feynman. But I, reading that, this other book, um, Beat of a Different Drum, I did get the sense that um, uh, Julian Schwinger got a little bit of um, the short end of the stick simply because he was kind of a boring guy. Like he was just a basic physicist who kind of like plotted through, did the math, got the results, got the answers. He didn't have the theatrics and drama to go with it. And when you look at Feynman's overall story, there's like way too many entertaining, like almost Las Vegas stage magician type of anecdotes littering his biography that it makes me suspicious. Like there's stuff about his quantum computing uh, period. Then there's the stuff that he got famous for with the space shuttle crash, right? Challenger crash. And so he did the dramatic O-ring seal in cold water that fractured. Turned out later that that was not actually the cause of the crash. So it's like, I'm always a little bit skeptical and suspicious when people get famous on drama. It's like, uh, and anyway, so that's, uh, but I'm sure he was like a talented genius and stuff. I just, but uh, I'm sort of beginning to second, second guess myself on my assessment of people like that. People who have a very, theatrical and impresario type of personality. And anyway, so that's kind of my take on finding. So you think he was like a little too magical, maybe? I think he definitely managed perceptions and optics a lot. So like the safe cracking thing, like if I remember correctly, he actually figured out the combination like beforehand by actually like trial and error, but then yeah. he would stage it later in front of people by pretending like he would magically figure it out, right? Yeah. And that's that's yeah. sort of a stage management type of personality. And um, the, there's a, Steve Jobs had that too. And a lot of ca very charismatic people have that. Like they try to make you think uh, it's more magical than it is because they are hiding the hard work and sort of the boring bits and only showcasing sort of the drama, right? And th that's good for marketing. That's good for some things. But I don't know. It's uh, It always makes me like, uh, double check everything and triangulate whatever I think about it from like three different sources because you can't trust people who present that way. And I think partly I might be projecting because I'm partly that way too. And I know when I'm consciously like trying to manage perceptions and stuff. So I know when I'm like pulling, putting on a show versus when I'm being I don't know, honest. This sounds like one of those things where like people are harshest about people who are most like themselves. <laughs> That would be very flattering if I were anything like Feynman, but <laughs> unfortunately, I'm absolutely mediocre on physics. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, you could also get mediocre at painting like Feynman did. I mean, his painting is nice, but it's, I'm gonna call it mediocre. He was a mediocre painter. Is it like um, George W. Bush, um, yeah, who is also a mediocre painter, but like a very sincere and enthusiastic one. Have you seen any of the George uh, Bush's paintings? I haven't seen any of Bush's paintings. I'd have to go look at them. Oh God, yeah, you have to. He's from your state. He's entirely like, he's kind of redeemed his um, reputation and sort of, um, what do you call it? Uh, laundered his uh, presidency's reputation in the most creative way possible by becoming a mediocre painter. He didn't do like billion dollar charities. He painted dogs. Yeah, I don't know if that's, I don't think he's managed to like pull the wool over very many people's eyes, the painting thing, except the people who wanted to have their 
all pulled over their eyes, which he like. I don't know. I, I even when he was in office, I never actually disliked him as much as a lot of people did. Like I didn't like um, everybody else around him, like uh, uh, Dick Cheney and uh, Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz. The rest of the neocon crowd, they were awful. But Bush himself, I think he kind of bumbled and fumbled a bunch of things. But I, he didn't strike me as like actively malicious and evil. Like, partly, I think we're recalibrating everything because of Trump. And relative to Trump, anybody looks like a saint almost. But um, yeah, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, Bush managed to redeem his uh, image a little bit with his dog paintings. I don't know. Maybe that's all image stuff like Feynman supposedly does. with his. Yeah, like, same thing. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, so okay. I'm not saying total, but um, I appreciate that he, you know, Bush chose painting as his route to redemption, as opposed to I, say, you know, Bill Gates' um, approach to laundering his reputation was setting up this huge $50 billion um, nonprofit thing, yeah, the Gates Foundation. Nonprofit. And it's like, it's all right. It's hilarious yeah. in Africa, Venkat. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I would say I'm more of a fan of Bush's paintings than I am of Bill Gates' um, charity, even though Gates is good. I mean, he's done good work, yeah. But um, yeah, anyway, we're on a sidetrack, but what else are we doing on the letter O? Um, I had one oh, more thing I wanted to say about something, but I can't remember it now. It's fine. Um, should let it slide. Fine. Uh, the next thing up on our list is opera. Ooh, opera. Which um, I probably have more to say about this than you, but maybe not. How many operas have you seen, Venkat? How many operas have I seen? I think one, and I hated it. And I don't even remember which one it was. This was, uh, yeah, this was when I was backpacking in um, Europe as a grad student, this was 1998. And this was actually in Vienna. So it's a very oh. appropriate place to be watching things like opera. And I got like a last minute standing room, only 30, um, was it euros back then? No, this was before euros, 30 whatever Austrian marks, I think. And it was annoying. It was kind of rainy. I went with a couple of other people from the backpacking hostel. And, but yeah, I, I've never enjoyed opera. So it sounds like you enjoy opera. You know, it's funny. I don't think I enjoy Well, I don't think I enjoy watching it as much as I enjoy doing it. Like, it's fun to do, but it's not as much. I don't. I mean, I think I appreciate it more now that I understand like the artistic production that goes into vocal, the vocal like opera as a vocal like skill set and how incredibly hard and talented like the people who do it are. Um, but like operas themselves, like I also, I mean, I think operas and musicals are like very similar, right? Like it's, you're telling a story mm -hmm. with songs. Um, both of these, even as a kid, like we watched a lot of musicals as kids. For some reason on like film i guess my mom was very into them um yeah i think there's a spectrum a there right like uh, what's the wait is the nutcracker considered an opera or no that's um no it's a ballet what, it's a ballet okay yeah but it also has like i don't know a big storyline with some singing it has an orchestra but there's no singers oh yeah 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 i don't think there's any actual singing okay you're right no. Okay, so the only thing I have liked that I've seen that's like opera is the, what's the, uh, the one by the South Park guys, the, the Broadway musical, the, uh, the Book oh. of uh, Mormon. Yeah, Book the Book of Mormon. Mormon. Yeah, oh, I love that. that. It's yeah. great. Yeah, that was awesome. That was really good. Yeah. yeah. And I think overall, if I had to pick, I would kind of tolerate Broadway musicals, but not um, opera, not so much, but uh, proper opera. Like, uh, how many have you watched? I've watched one and not liked it. How many have you watched? Actual operas? I'm going to say, like, less, maybe, like, ten. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you're maybe a fan. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, as I say, how have many... Have you performed, I, have you performed yeah, in I've some? I've been in, like, I want to say three. Though one of them wasn't, like, a full-length opera. Um, I performed in, like, two full-length operas. <laughs> Maybe we cut them a bit, but like three operas and then like a shorter, like one act opera. Um, so uh, what chorus. was your role there? Was it like- uh, Chorus. Um, did you have a solo or chorus? Okay. Chorus, chorus, chorus. <laughs> <laughs> chorus. 
Uh, is that like a huge class divide, like between the chorus and the soloists? Like the soloists are like in a stratosphere somewhere. A little bit. I mean, all the productions I were in were like small community productions in New York. Um, so like the difference between like a star of the show and the rest of the hoi poi that like is the chorus, um, that's not really like, they don't <laughs> okay, show so up to your, I mean, like, so the biggest difference is you don't go to the same rehearsals. There's like the main cast, like the actual main characters have a lot more like rehearsal than you do. Um, and they spend a lot more time like actually like acting things out whereas like you as the chorus like you learn your part and then you, you know there's a couple of there's usually a couple chorus scenes and so you figure out like where your staging is and we had to do some dancing um in both of them so you figure out like your dance and stuff and then how to exit and enter the stage and where to go and how to like run to different parts for different things um yeah i was in a performance of madam butterfly and one of um what was the other one we did Tavalaria Rusticana. And I think for both of them, we cut it down so that it wasn't like the full length thing. But yeah, okay. I don't know. So, um, so for I the second one, you would have had to sing in Italian, I assume? Oh, yeah. And uh, I think both of them are Italian. Oh, both are Italian. Okay. Yeah, Madame Butterfly is, is definitely Italian. Yeah. Wouldn't it be called the Italian word for butterfly? Like, what is it? Oh, okay. You would think that, but no. It's called Madame Butterfly because it's. I think it's called Madame Butterfly as a nod to like the storyline, which involves an American um, army officer okay. in Japan. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Italian. Huh. Yeah, I actually don't know when Madame Butterfly was written, like when its libretto was done, because that storyline is very, is it modern? It seems modern. Like, feels like World War II era, right? I mean, um, the U.S. and Japan have had relations since uh, the 1850s, so it could be older. Uh, yeah. Okay. It yeah, Robert, like, what's his name? I thought it was like MacArthur or something like that. No, no. That, that was, the World War II definitely was a major chapter, but the starting was uh, Robert Perry opening up Japan in 1850-something. That's when Japan was forced open to open to international trade, and they hated everybody else because of that. So yeah, it could be from that era. I don't know. But I think have to it's look probably it up. from that era. I'm pretty sure it's from that era. Um, like, yeah, that seems more correct. Okay. Um, so you were in this opera and you don't know what era it was set in. That's funny. I mean, we had to wear like Japanese style accoutrements and like, oh, okay. I don't know, we had kimono and painted our faces and like did the whole thing. Um, yeah, it was fun. I don't know. Opera's interesting. It's like a whole little world onto itself, kind of. Um, but it's also international. I don't know. I don't know. Huh. I guess, like, okay, so I guess the thing about opera that I find kind of interesting is, like, its place in American culture. Um, like, it's kind of like high society. So it's a... It's like this weird high society signaling function to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, well, how would you distinguish the sort of high society signaling function from the symphony? Like I think a lot more cities have the symphony and the opera is kind of weird, right? The South has its weird, uh, is it Memphis that has the grand old Opry as they, they spell it differently? Yeah, that's, but that's like honky tonk, I thought. Oh, okay. Like, Grand Ole Opry is like the center of like country music. Oh, okay. <laughs> then I totally mixed them up. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so. Houston is like a really good opera. San Francisco opera is really well known and fairly famous. Um, the New York Met, of course, is like the golden standard. Um, apparently, so I was taking opera lessons when I lived in New York City um, from this really, really wonderful singer um, who, yeah, um, and at some point she told me that like, she was like, yeah, you know, like if you get a job at the Met in the chorus, so not even like a lead or anything, you can get like, I mean, it's a full-time job, which is like mm -hmm. a lot of, they do a lot of shows a year, but it's like, you know, like a hundred K a year. Like it's a good job. It's like a oh, okay. you know, respectable, but that's probably the most high paid chorus job in America is the New York Met. Um, huh. Yeah. 
It's interesting. Anyways, like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's like, I'm not really sure where it, which direction to take the conversation on this. Cause like, it's interesting because like, there's also like your body type plays a lot in terms of like what you're capable, what roles you're capable of playing in opera. Mm -hmm. So like, there's like kind of this weird, I don't know if weird is the right word for it, but um, it's sort of like a sorting hat of like where, what roles you're even eligible to play and what kinds of operas you would be a good fit for. And you kind of get slotted into those based on who you are physically, what your body is like physically capable of producing, the sounds mm -hmm. that you're physically able to produce is like 100% who you are and so like that's kind of like set in a weird way um i'm uh, i'm a mezzo okay that's the middle range uh, or something right mezzo mm. so there's there's like two roles mostly for women i think technically you can probably get lower those like maybe but soprano is like high and then there's mezzo which is lower than soprano um and a lot of that i think has to do with where in your vocal box, the sound gets produced or something. I might be messing that up, don't quote me on that. But, um, and then for men, there's the bass and the tenor. The tenor is okay. like higher, the bass is lower. Um, but I think there's also like, but there's also like types of mezzo altos. And I can't remember exactly what type I am, but my, like my singing instructor was like pushing me, you know, cause she'd find songs. She's like, your voice will best, fit this type of like song repertoire um i feel like one of the things that, yeah i don't know she said my voice sounded more like i don't know who this woman is flicka who's like a kind of a famous mezzo who i think sang okay. like semi i, I want to say wagnerian but i could be wrong um clearly I remember a lot from this um, so do you still do do you still sing or is this like New York several years ago and you don't anymore? I was taking lessons over Zoom, funnily enough, <laughs> when I lived in San Francisco. And then um, I quit when I decided I was going to save up my singing money to buy a house in Texas. So, uh, your opera dreams given up because you wanted to buy a house. That's yeah, kind of like, I know. Opera or house. <laughs> Sometimes you have to make decisions, man. I don't yeah. know. Um, yeah, it's fun. I can still sing some things. Um, I'm, at some point, I might find a choir here in town to join, but I'm actually not. It's so, like, it's funny. I don't, I mean, I like music and I like listening to different stuff, but um, my favorite part about singing production is like the process of like, like I really like the technical technicalities around vocal production more so than like songs. Um, so like, how do I explain? There's like, like, so the things that I find cool about singing are like, um, how placing like the act of where you place your voice in your head produces different sound and working on yeah. getting like certain resonances to come out at different parts of the scale is like fun. Like the technical, um, the technical semi-athletic part of singing that is like the um i don't know yeah production. i get it i get it so okay. rather than like um singing like a really sublime performance you would like to be able to like i don't know shatter wine glasses <laughs> but producing the perfect pitch that kind of thing right kind of or like being able to like like get a pop song and sing pop which like i have for a long time have been very bad at singing pop songs because pop singing is not vocal is not operatic singing like the place that you like the location in your um kind of just like head that the vocal production is is very different than pop next time we circle back to uh m or o or something you're gonna have to sing I'm not going to let you off the hook. <laughs> make noise. I can make noise. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we need I a know. musical segment in the show. Oh, I see. Okay. Musical segment. What are you yeah. going to do for the musical segment? Becca? I have no musical talent, so I'm not part of the musical segment. So we can either have the musical guest like Saturday Night Live, or you can, <laughs> if we can't find a musical guest, you're going to have to sing. <laughs> Great. All right. So we will be finding a musical guest. Sounds like yeah. a plan. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Opera. What, else, what do we have to talk about today? 
Um, oh, I'll add one thing about opera. So there's a great Terry Pratchett novel based on um, opera. So uh, though it's, it's basically a sort of parody of Phantom of the Opera, which is uh, kind of like a double parody because Phantom of the Opera is itself kind of like, uh, it's more Broadway musical take on opera, right? Yeah. Anyway, so the, um, it's called Masquerade, I think, and it's pretty good. So hmm. one of the more interesting Terry Pratchett's where there's literally a phantom in the opera. Oh my God. Wait, is it, so one term that I've heard described that describes like science fiction as a space opera is, is Masquerade, is that like a space opera as well? Oh no, Terry Pratchett is fantasy, not uh, science fiction. So it's like, um, Oh, I see. Ghosts and witches. So this is one of his uh, stories in the witches series. So three. Uh, so there's a um, young witch who decides she wants to be an opera singer, and she goes off and becomes one in the city. But two older witches want to like bring her into their coven, so they go after mm -hmm. her to bring her back. But while they're there, they solve the mystery of um, actual phantom in the opera and oh. shenanigans going on. So it's kind of fun. That's cute. <laughs> really cute. Opera houses are cool. I mean, one cool thing about opera, like back in the day, and even even now, I think, like opera houses, when you build them, they have to be resonant enough so that like, there's no artificial, um, what do you call it? Like sound production. Like they don't use oh, amps okay. for it. So all of the, so every opera house has to be built in such a way that the singers can project out into the audience because it's all like live singing. Wow, okay live performance. Yeah, um, my voice teacher used to tell me that the um, a good voice, like a, a good, like when you produce good operatic sound, it won't actually like converge. Like you won't be able to, the best place for hearing it will be like 20 or 30 feet away from the actual singer. Um, just because the way the vocal stuff works. Oh, well, okay. Middle of the so resonance chamber or something. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's cool. The human voice is fucking awesome. Um, this is true of symphonies as well, right? All the classic uh, symphony houses there are like natural acoustics. There's no okay. amplification and loudspeakers and stuff. Okay. Oh, but, but since you brought up space opera, yeah, that's a tangent we should go down at some point on S, but just in terms of like operatic as um, and a descriptor of all sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. share one interesting thing. I read this thing a while back um, that was a critique of uh, Jurassic Park and all the other dinosaur movies. And it said something like, oh, these dinosaur movies, you can think of them as the human characters don't really matter. They're kind of like sideshows. And really it's built around dinosaur arias. And that really struck me as accurate. Like the original Jurassic Park is basically built around that one aria where the big T-Rex chases the group on a Jeep, right? And if you look at dinosaur movies with that uh, perspective, suddenly it becomes really funny because it's like the humans are like the chorus, but the entire action is built around the major charismatic dinosaurs having their moment on their stage. So it's really funny. So. Yeah, or like the, the duet where they chase the humans through the kitchen kind of thing. Yep, yep. Like, like, oh yeah, yeah, so that would be two velociraptors that sort of team up and chase the humans, exactly. So there you go, that's a duet. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um. So we should think of more operatic, uh, things that have operatic character. Yeah, like this probably yeah. more than that. Probably. Uh, this was actually in, at the same time I read something about uh, like martial arts action type movies. So mm -hmm. they're not quite operatic in structure, but John Wick, for example, it's basically like a video game style choreography, but it's entirely built around set piece um, fight sequences. So uh, it, it's slightly different from like, um, Asian martial arts movies like Jackie Chan and stuff because those are like a different genre. But John Wick is particularly interesting because it's um, kind of like Eastern style martial arts dance movies done with a Western sensibility where the basic John Wick plot is kind of like cartoonish almost. It's fun cartoonish, but basically the plot is not the point. The point is there's all these really carefully done set piece action sequences that I would, I would call that operatic as well. Yeah, where like the the song and like the like the song is like the scene, and then the um, the story kind of like fits in around like the scene. So anything that's got like a like the 
the dance routine, not dance, the fight routine scenes, it's like the thing that the rest of the story is nicely constructed around. And you kind of, exactly. you know, think of it as like, when I'm like, when I think of this, I think of like almost like a mansion or like a house with like a series of rooms and like the, the rooms would be like the, um, the arias or the, you know, the dinosaur chasing T-Rex or like a particular fight scene. And so the rest of the movie is just figuring out how to get from one room to the next. Totally. Um, and it's quite literal, by the way, at least in John Wick, the metaphor of levels or rooms, that's totally there. Like in John uh, Wick uh, 3, there's like a glass house with like four or five levels and he fights his way up each level. And each level is a different kind of fight scene. Like on the first level, he's fighting two Thai fighters with like um, short swords or like Muay Thai kind of uh, um, fighting style, then all the way up to the master sort of boss level. So there's like a video game metaphor of rising up levels and doing the boss level. There's also this sort of set piece action level where it's like you're fighting with guns on one level or swords on the next level and barehanded on the third level. Uh, and that, that actually, I think Bruce Lee did it too in one of his um, last movies. It was a series of levels and uh, each level was a school of uh, fighting and it demonstrated that school of fighting. And if I remember correctly, the topmost level was the style of no style. And that featured, I think, Kareem Abdul-Jafar fighting Bruce Lee. So it was like a very weird, visually weird set piece because Kareem Abdul-Jafar is what, uh, almost seven feet tall and Bruce Lee is this little um, five foot one guy, mm -hmm. but he's the teacher and the other guy's the master. And so it's like funny, so, but yeah, the, there's like a operatic structure to these sort of um, martial arts movies as well. All right. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting how there's like levels of things you can talk about with opera. Like there's operas in like the descriptor and like the product and the output or whatever. And then there's also like the, I guess more of what I was talking about earlier, like the production of opera and like the social, like actuality of like the behind the scenes of like mm -hmm. what it is to be and produce an opera, which is interesting anyways. Um, you should do cool. that, you should produce an opera. Yeah. I mean, most operas these days, like, I mean, if you think about it, an opera is a musical, the difference is like the um, type of vocal technique, um, really, you really get down to it, like the nuts and bolts, like an opera has very different vocal technique than musicals, um, like Broadway musical has just the, just the sound that you produce as a human is like very different than the opera one, and that's basically the basically the difference um mm -hmm. so like the most modern i mean it's like hamilton right like a modern opera it's a modern opera um we just don't call it that because it's not like an opera but oh wait are, are you saying hamilton has the vocal style of opera rather than broadway musicals i'm sorry could you... uh, hamilton does it have the musical style of opera or broadway musicals Ni almost neither because isn't it rap based i haven't watched it yeah, it's oh. another thing I refuse to watch. Is it rap based? I thought it was a regular like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the whole thing. <laughs> I actually took a Broadway class when I was in SF. It was fun. We did like singing and dancing, but like just like they'd pick um, an act or like a song from like four or five of the really contemporary. So it was like contemporary Broadway. So they picked like from shows that have been done in the last, like, last two or three years. And Hamilton was one of them. Um, and yeah, it's all rap. It's like rap. It's like very fast like vocal stuff. Um, oh, okay. It's not, it's not with the, it's not traditional Broadway in the same way. Um, actually, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And then uh, have you watched Broadway Hamilton? Such a big deal. Have you watched Hamilton? No. Oh, you haven't. Uh, yeah. Have you watched much Broadway at all? Like you lived in New York, right? Have you watched Cats or any of the other major ones? I haven't seen Cats. I've seen Phantom of the Opera. I haven't seen a whole bunch. I didn't go to, I didn't go to Broadway shows a lot. I saw a Book of Mormon. Um, I, I saw a, a Broadway play right before I left New York, which was like Peter and the Starcatcher or something. Was, the set design was amazing. Um, huh. Uh, now that uh, you're yeah. listing them, I just remembered the very first Broadway musical I watched was actually in India when my own high school put on a production of um, Joseph and the Amazing Technical and Dreamcoat. Yeah. So it was kind of ridiculous because uh, it's a bunch of Indians who don't know the culture, don't know how to sing the songs and a bunch of like music teachers who don't know how to teach that style of music, but still they yeah. put on, like, so it was basically, 
uh, remote foreign reconstruction of Broadway musical style based on like tape recordings and stuff. So yeah. it, it wasn't bad. It, it wasn't great, but it was like, it was kind of interesting. So that was my first introduction to a Broadway musical. I think that's an Android Lloyd Webber too. Yeah, it's he an was, Android Lloyd Webber. He was like a, he was a little bit of a, um, he popular, he did like very popular musicals. So like my understanding is his like brand of stuff was new and different. Like he had like guitars in the, the, um, yeah. The music stuff. didn't sound very difficult. It sounded like any competent singer could pick it up level of music. Yeah, but when he did his stuff, I think he was very like kind of semi-controversial because it was a break from the past. Oh, stuff, okay. Is my understanding? I don't know. Anyways, yeah, he was very modern. My mom played a lot of his stuff. Oh. She liked it a lot. Up. All right. Um, cool. So we talked about one more thing. Um, All right. What do we have? Well, let's talk about two things. Let's talk about open plan offices and then briefly talk a little bit about um, your new project the or the project okay. you guys just put out. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, let's uh, do the second one first since it'll just take 20 seconds. So it's just a, a shilling the project. So the Yacht Collective just put out uh, its second report called The New Old Home. It's uh, led by Pamela Hobart and Drew Shornom. So it's basically a set of um, interesting perspectives on what the home of the future might look like. And it's a slide deck of about, I think, 60, 70 slides. And I have a couple of uh, contributions there. One of them has to do with um, mansions and the other one has to do with domestic cozy so if anybody's interested in the future of houses you should uh, go check out the new old home report yeah new did you check it out i started flipping through it i got distracted which is i don't know what yeah but it looked good i'm, I'm gonna get back to it mm -hmm. um all right so yeah. that was the little advertisement so let's talk about uh, what are the yeah. oh, oh open plan offices open plan offices yes what do you have to say about them not good things. Um, have you worked, have you spent much time in them? I don't think I've ever worked in a non-open plan office. <laughs> I don't think I've ever worked in an open plan office. Are you serious, Venkat? What? Yeah, in grad school, I had an actual office that I shared with two other students. And then as a postdoc, that came down to an office shared with one person, but he was never there. So I basically had a closed door office to myself. And then when I went to Xerox for four years, uh, I only spent three of those years working out of an office. And during that time, again, I had a shared office with uh, one other person and um, uh, he was a lab guy. So he spent most of his time in the lab. So again, I mostly had the office to myself. And then I quit and started working from home and Starbucks. <laughs> so basically I've never had uh, an open plan office. So I've always walked past them sort of looking down my nose at all the pros working in their large open sort of feed lots. Yeah. I pity you people. I guess, okay, so I guess I lied a little bit for a while. When I worked at Walmart as an intern over the summer, I had a cubicle, which was nice. Okay. I had my very own cubicle. It was very fancy. I think it was probably the fanciest office I've ever had. Um, <laughs> I love it. Cubicle I like it. is as low as I've ever gone. I've gone to a, I worked out of a cubicle for one year, but that's as low as I've ever sunk. I don't know. Cubicles are actually pretty great. We like make fun mm -hmm. of them for being like very like soul sucking, but I love my cubicle. Like decorate it, like <laughs> things up on it. People could come and lean over it and be like, hey Lisa, what's going on? Like, it's great. Um, oh, so you had one of those lower uh, style ones where if you're yeah. sitting down on your chair, it's like a foot or two above, um, uh, about monitor height, right? Like I think the one yeah. time I worked in a cubicle, it was one of the higher ones where if you're sitting mm -hmm. down, the top of the partition is like two feet above. It's like a bathroom stall almost. So I had uh, that kind of cubicle. No, this was one that you could like lean over, but you'd have oh, to- Oh yeah, yeah. I've seen those in movies and TV shows. Yeah, they had them <laughs> at Walmart in the ISD information systems department. It was fabulous. I, yeah, there was like the, the place where the consultants all sat was like very open office plan-y because they had a bunch of consultants that did work for them. This was like back in 2008, 2009. Okay. Anyways, decade ago. So I'm assuming it's basically the same though. I'm pretty sure they haven't updated it. So that's like almost an open plan. If people can lean over and sort of uh, talk to you or um, sort of see you in your little cubicle while walking past, it's almost open plan, but not quite. It no, still has no, some partitions. 
No, the petitions are key though, man. The petitions are super <laughs> key. Because like after that, I worked at Etsy, which is super open plan. I worked for a consulting firm where everywhere we went, it was basically open plan. You're just hanging out with your buddies, like in an office, with, like other people. Um, and then Etsy was open plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, point, open just, plan is hard but did you at least have your own full desk as an open plan yeah i did i did i've never had to do like the hot desk swapping but i think they started instituting that i want to say at etsy like a few months after i left and it sounded horrible oh it, it gets worse i mean it's not just hot desk swapping that's the worst kind of open plan like i won't name the company but there's this um, company i visited in london that had like kind of fancy glass and chrome kind of modern office but its idea of open plan was like almost long cafeteria style tables where nobody even had a full desk to themselves and you had maybe a two foot by one foot area for your keyboard and monitors like lined up one after the other like your monitor would be touching the edge of the next person's monitor and these were like they were sitting programming on backless chairs so like bar stool type things and i was like what the hell is this? Who, who can work like this? But it was all these people and they all had like code editors up and running. And it was like, oh my God, it's like, this is um, the feedlot of uh, open plan. So that yeah. sounds like an internet cafe. I've been in internet cafes that are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad, worse. It, it was that, it was kind of like that. Yeah. But this was an actual office of an, of a company. That I won't or you're make. expected to do like 40 hours of like at least chair time kind of thing. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's one of those things that everybody hates, but the incentives are stacked where it's like inevitably it'll go there. Like it helps save costs. It helps like monitor in a big brother way what the employees are doing. It creates that, you know, uh, boiler room kind of pressure to deliver because the more people can kind of constantly see what you're doing, the less you can sort of goof off and like, I don't know, play video games and stuff. So it's especially for uh, uncreative or unimaginative kinds of work where you just want people to grind out like fairly uncreative, but it, it requires like, you know, uh, cranking through spreadsheet models of particular things and like banking or something. It's like not super creative or imaginative, but you do need basic intelligence to like do it reasonably competently. And you want to crank through like 80 hours a week doing that kind of stuff while on Adderall or whatever uh, drugs you're on. That sounds like appropriate fit for the extreme kind of open office. I guess so. I don't know. I just, every software company I've ever worked at has done an open office plan. I guess like there were the two startups. It was like a tiny little thing, but you're all just like in the same little small space together. And then, yeah. How long have you worked from home? I started working from home about two years ago when I got my current job. Okay, so Blockstream is like fully distributed or something? Yeah, I mean, there's an office I'd go to a few days a week. Was it even that when I lived in SF? So they had like okay. an office space in SF, but it was hard to get to from my place. So, and my teammates are distributed. So it like, there was no one in the office I'd be going to like hang out with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's mostly remote. It's, I mean, at this point, it's a fully distributed company. Um, and I think that's, oh, by the way, that's one of the themes in the new old home um, report. A lot of the sort of visioning is about how the home is becoming the new office. So it's like, um, and so many companies, like I think Facebook and Twitter at least have announced like permanent work from home policy support. So I think more and more companies are going to go that way. And in a way, open plan offices are like the peak before the collapse of like traditional office culture. I think it can't get any worse than that. So it has to like go somewhere else just to transform, right? Oh, and uh, speaking of open plan offices, um, at some point I started describing Slack as um, the virtual open plan office compared to email. And that's exactly what it is, it, it, which is kind of ironic because the name Slack suggests that there's like a relaxed, like spacey vibe to it. But no, it's a total boiler room of like alerts and like hundred people in the conversation. So um, it's kind of interesting that it's been re reproduced online. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that as like forums. I was actually talking to a friend the other day about like, so since I moved back home, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, I've kind of been like rethinking a lot of things that I did as like a teenager and as a kid that I hadn't thought about in like a decade since I've been gone. A lot of it's just like the weather patterns here are the same. So it like reminds me of things I've like forgotten about. 
Um, anyways, I've been thinking about like the way I use the internet as like a teenager. Um, mm-hmm. As like basically, I feel like my biggest. I was on AIM, but the way that I use AIM, uh, AIM is like mostly one-on-one conversations. Maybe they were also group chats, but there weren't like forums you'd go hang out in in the same way that like BBS mm-hmm. seem to be. Um, which is like, so I feel like most of my like early internet was very like intimate conversations with randos, um, <laughs> intimate one-on-one conversations. So like, I'm, yeah, I, like I think I've, I've never really been into like open plan anything like group chats are not a place that yeah and that's your twitter style as well right more dms than um open tweeting because open twitter is like the biggest open plan office around and if it actually had work to do it would be horrible is it is twitter open plan i don't feel, well we've talked about how you know it's it's open plan in the structure of the medium but because it's not a place where anybody actually does any work it doesn't feel oppressive whereas a slack uh, typically okay. has like a work function or some kind of coordination thing like i have a slack i have a ribbon farm slack but it's not a place i do any work in so it's just a hangout and shoot the breeze place so it's not oppressive uh, but speaking of that like people often compare slack and discord and Yak Collective is um, built on Discord and we deliberately chose that. And it has an interestingly different vibe. It, it too has sort of the channel structure of Slack. So it's got the chat stream vibe, but I think because it has its roots in gaming culture and games are fundamentally more a leisure activity than a work activity, it does not feel as um, sort of open plan office as uh, Slack. So Slack definitely has that open plan office vibe. Discord has more of a, all right, this is structured this way just to like enable people to like play games together. And it feels kind of like less oppressive. Uh. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how like, I was thinking about this earlier, we should probably wrap up soon. But um, one of the things I was thinking about earlier when you were talking about how your, maybe this was before we started recording, um, but you mentioned that one of the parts of work that you're doing with the Yacht Collective currently involves a lot of like managing sort of mm-hmm. skill sets, um, which is like interesting that like, like I feel like there's like types of work that it doesn't really matter what like the producer output is, like there's still like functions that need to like happen in order for the thing to get done and like management mm-hmm. is one of those like, but it's like, I kind of bring it up because it's like one of the, um, Oh, management is like one of those things that like when you work in an organization or if you like just go and work in like corporate America like I feel like management kind of has taken on a lot of like prestige and like social roles and like there's like kind of some status weird stuff about where you rank in the organization but like when you take all that away and you just go back to like okay we have a bunch of people maybe we're all trying to play a game let's say we're all trying to play a game together so we all need to be able to communicate so we need a platform to communicate it on okay like you know, you end up with something like Discord, and it's like, why does Discord have channels? It's like, well, at some point in this conversation of all these people are trying to coordinate, we need to be able to, like, break off and talk about different co- topics and, like, organize it so that we can, like, have all this communication happening. Um, so, I don't know, it's kind of interesting that, like, when you think about it, like, okay, so, like, Discord is, like, gamers need to organize themselves and, like, have conversations and communication about, like, a work product, in theory, which is, like, the coordination of producing, like, a game outcome, mm-hmm. right? Um, versus like Slack is like a similar thing, but it was built around, it was built around, um, coordinating like a work product that is like whatever it is that your work produces. Um, Slack also, I believe originally started out as an idea for a game that morphed into an idea for an office workflow product. Uh, but it definitely has a total office workflow product vibe now. And, uh, it's, um, yeah. But uh, I think yeah, what you're getting at sounds like um, a kind of form follows function kind of uh, uh, thing. It's like, yes, certain things have to get done. Certain managers have to be jerks and like crack the whip and get things out the door. And for them to do what they need to get done, the platform has to have certain characteristics. So it's like, um, yeah, so there's definitely a bunch of that. But there's also, I think, um, beyond form follows function, there's also kind of like a form follows um, neuroses and psychopathic tendencies and stuff, right? So if you're a sociopath manager, you will prefer platforms that allow you to do certain things. Whereas if you're a more empathetic manager, you might prefer a different kind of platform. So it's, so the form follows function has dark 
underbelly stuff to it as well. Your feature set, right? It's like, this is like the base organization that you need in order to communication to happen in an organized manner, but then the feature set that you require above that as like a chooser of software, right? So like Slack offers you the ability to delete your data after X days, right? Because that helps <laughs> with like your, um, your legal compliance stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, company policy, everything's deleted after six months. Everything just gets deleted after six months. Um, or like the ability to like see all the private chats of everyone in your channel because you are the like, I don't know what that is. Like, what is that impulse? Like the, I am the owner of this space. This is my house. The Slack is like my, my uh, I think domain. some of that is actually, uh, again, legal compliance. Like if a lawsuit is brought against a company, then the email communications are not private. Slack communications are not private. They can be like uh, subpoenaed and uh, brought into evidence for court cases. That's happened with like powerful people and stuff. So yeah, it's a, partly it's like, you should not have an expectation of privacy when you're using a work flag because you're supposed to be talking about work, take your private conversations elsewhere. I think that's the general expectation set up. But beyond that, you're right. There's got to be like sociopathic managers who kind of just want to eavesdrop and like intrude on work teams and like basically act like, I don't know, big brother panopticon spy type people. So, that, and that's kind of bad because you need, um, uh, it, it's almost like certain kinds of trust. You kind of need to have proof of trust by having like not spying on people. Like it, it's almost like proof of trust is I will let your communications be truly encrypted and private and I'll still trust you to do what I expect you to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I think at, the end, at some point you get into the psychology of a manager, right? Like what do they see their role as in the organization as like, because I think that that's not always crystal clear. Like as a manager, different managers that I've had, they like, really seem to think their jobs are completely different things. Oh yeah, totally. And most of them, their jobs as they define them are kind of more, I don't know, meeting personal psychological needs for I don't know, power or control or whatever, rather than a particular style of getting things done. So that's a whole longer conversation. We should talk about managers sometime. We should talk about managers at some point. It's an yeah. interesting. Yeah. And management. Yep. Management. All right. So that was open plan offices and, 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 and OP. Next, next time will be P. Huh? Next time will be P. Next time yeah. is P. We can talk about project management maybe. Pursuing <laughs> the next topic with P next week. Yeah. Well, Venkat, it's been a pleasure to chat with you today. Um, Always a pleasure, Lisa. Great. So see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.